put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. But hey, if the video is just too long for you to watch, chances are I recorded a shorter version and the link will be in the description box. It's not an inferior video, it's merely a Cliff's Notes version of this very video. Night Move Review. Batman's been operating for a while now in Gotham City, and this uh, makes him trouble for the criminals. The the White Knight of Gotham, as he's called, the new district attorney, Harvey Dent, is very aggressive in taking them down. And he's a person that they really put, that, that the public puts a lot of faith in, because he really does seem like the way to go, and he's really doing a lot to rid the streets of Gotham of these criminals. And so the criminals turn to the Joker. And he starts a, a genuine reign of terror. And along the way of basically daring Batman to stop him, some really compelling moral questions are raised. The... This is the, the, the kind of sequel that you always hope a sequel will be. It takes everything that the first one was and just goes bigger. You know, it... It doesn't lack any good quality that the first one had, it merely, merely, it rather improves upon it. With the origin of Batman, with, with, with that well out of the way, and with Batman set, there's really nothing, you know, the, the, the best way to, to start a sequel like this is just immediately get to the villain and start, you know, building him up, and that's what the film does. After a really great introduction to the Joker, which I refuse to give away upon threat of death, we start seeing just how dangerous and unpredictable he is. The Joker steals the show for the movie. He he is truly unpredictable, and as the film itself, utterly relentless. The, the compelling thing about this Joker, and he does have some great Jokers to contend with. You know, the animated, voiced by Mark Hamill, J Jack Nicholson's. You know, there, there have been some great Jokers. I would say this is the most compelling one, the most unforgettable one. A lot of it is that you truly just never know. I, I keep using the word unpredictable. You never know what he's going to do next. And every time you think that this is going to be where he breaks. This is going to be where he snaps. He basically isn't human in, in the... and yet he is. Physically, he's human, but psychologically, you can't really find the humanity in him. And it's, it's just truly terrifying. And that's actually something quite interesting. That's the second time I use a... A, a word 
derived from the word terror, and truly the Joker in this is a terrorist, which allows Nolan to really make some comments on the you know the, the state of the world today with the threat of terrorism and all these you know the, these additional powers granted to governments on account of it because we're afraid because we you know we want to feel safe again we we miss that feeling and that's what this really conjures up and we are as afraid of the Joker as the people of Gotham and we understand their panicking reactions to him in sort of to, to, to make the Joker as effective as possible every scene that involves him, and pretty much every scene in general in the movie, has at least one surprise. Something happens that you really didn't expect, and this is something that's extremely difficult to do well. It's something that Lost used to great effect early on, and then it you know, got pretty old, and a lot of new movies with twists strive for this kind of effect, and th this one pulls it off and makes it look easy. You know, it, it, every scene just has these completely unexpected twists and turns, and also about the Joker, he really, not only is he extremely threatening whenever he's on screen, when he isn't, you feel like he's there anyway. He's, excuse me, he's doing something even though we can't see it, or he's planning something, we just don't know what it is yet. And this truly is terrifying. The, I have to talk about the, the casting in general, the, Heath Ledger, rest in peace, everyone was surprised when, you know, for, for one thing when he was cast and for another when he blew us away in the performance. I can't see Heath Ledger in, in this character. I can't, I can't recognize him. I can't even really recognize him as a human being. It, it is... And, and that's what makes it so effective, because you know that there is a human being there. You know, I, I don't say this as a, any kind of... I, I mean no offense to, to Heath Ledger, uh, to, his, to his memory. It's, it's in fact a testament to the, the brilliance of the performance, that, that there really is just nothing left there that you can that you can hold on to. It's, it's a, you know, in, in, it's, it's a sort of contrast to the, 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 the villain where you, where you can kind of recognize this, there's something there that's, you know, ah, I understand he's doing this because this or that. There's just, there's, there's nothing like that. This draws a lot of inspiration from the excellent Alan Moore Batman comic, The Killing Joke, and it's, it, it really works out. You know, I'd, I would still like to see that one adapted just, you know, page for page, but after this, I really, there isn't, there isn't a lot of that comic that isn't already, you know, in, in this movie. Not necessarily directly tra translated, but they get the essence of it. And, you know, that, that's what Nolan really did. You know, 
this, like the first one, written by both Nolans and Dave Goyer, and they just really capture what this incarnation of the Joker is all about, you know, and really makes him terrifying, you know. More on the casting, Aaron Eckhart as, you know, Harvey Dent, fantastic, you know, the you believe in him. You find yourself really, you know, th thinking that this is, you know, like they say, this is the hero that Gotham needs, you know. The, you know, most of the cast, most of the sort of main cast from the original is back, you know. The only one who was really recast was the role of Rachel Dawes, and I think that was a really good decision. Maggie Gyllenhaal brings a lot more to the role. She's a lot more credible, and I feel much more for her character in this, even though I didn't like her in the first one. And she remains a nice, strong female character. Not a damsel in distress, not just some throwaway, you know... But yes, Alfred, who I forgot to mention in the, in the first one, I think, you know, Michael Caine returns, and yeah, he just has that, you know, it's not just the British accent, it's, it, Michael Caine is just really, really talented, and he is charming, you know, he was in his youth, and he is now, and you really believe that he cares about Bruce Wayne, you know, Old Man is Gordon returns, and he gets a little more, you know, Old Man gets to use more of his range in this one. You know, it the the tension of the Joker brings everyone you know a, a little further than they were in the first one. The uh, one I definitely forgot to mention: Morgan Freeman as Lucius Fox. You know, great performance, really charming, and just really and and a really good character. Also, I'm not really gonna particularly talk about who he is, though. And Bale as Bruce Wayne and Batman. We again have these really nice, you know... Yeah, he, he remains the best Batman, the best Bruce Wayne. This one, it's... You know, he, he's struggling with, for, for example, this is not a spoiler, because of Batman's emergence, he has inspired some other vigilantes, and, you know, this, this troubles him. It's not outright said, but I get the sense that it's, you know, the, these people could hurt others and maybe get themselves hurt, and it's really not what, you know, what he was looking to do. I have to mention the Bat Bale voice, the... It's back and it's worse than ever. I really hope he ditches it completely for Rises, because it's just... horrible at this one. It's much worse than it begins. You know, we... He was using it all the time. Pretty much every time he's in the suit, he uses the voice. And it's just... It's not scary. Here, it genuinely really is grating. In the first one, it was when, if, you know, after the scene had ended, you were like, you know, or after you left the theater, at least, you were like, oh, man, that kind of sounded goofy when he did that. When you're watching the scene, it works. In this one, it never works. It takes you, you know, it, it really distracts you in the scene, and you, you kind of just have to put up with it. It's, yeah, really, really great. This one really raises the bar. This one very much sets the standard for just, you know, superhero movies from here on out. And th this one raises the bar in that, you know, sort of where the first one had a... So someone who's sort of a match for Batman, this one takes a different approach, which is interesting, because, you know, we don't want to retread the first one. The first one did what it did really well, so we want a different one. And the Joker, 
again, Nolan really understands the character. He really understands the this relationship between Batman and the Joker as it is in the comics. And this is not a spoiler. You know, anyone who even knows the two characters knows this. You know, they're 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 opposites. There's this yin and yin and yang kind of thing. They you know, we have the the utter tragedy of Batman versus the comedy of the Joker. We have, you know, order of Batman versus chaos of the Joker. He's he's all about chaos in this. And yeah, it's just it's it's really really well done. And I, I don't think that's been completely done justice to in a live action film. I have not watched all the animated stuff. The, the, but yeah, so, so the, the bar is raised, there is a lot more destruction in this one, a lot more explosions and, you know, really big, big explosions as well, and, and this, it's, it's sort of, it's not just the explosions, it's the, it's, it's the tension of the next explosion. We don't know exactly when the next explosion is going to be. We don't know exactly what's going to blow up. But we know something is. And, you know, it, it doesn't feel like... I mean, again, explosions... There's explosions in basically all action movies. Certainly after, like, I don't know, 1960 or something. Even cheap action movies have, you know often have at least a few explosions. To have a lot of explosions isn't necessarily going to make your movie good. You know, man, I wish I had prepared some examples of bad movies with a lot of explosions. Ballistic, I think, has a lot of explosions, and it's a pretty terrible movie. You know, it's... This one, it, it's the way it uses the explosions. It's that the people hurt are not cannon fodder. It's that we actually care. We, we care when people get hurt in this. And, and that's also why it, you know, it, it again has this very realistic approach. And we really get sucked in. And this terrorist, again, terrorism, there's, as of 2001, and even before it actually, there have been so many movies about terrorists, and so often it's just this kind of rah rah, go get them, and you know, let's you know get payback for something that happened in real life in this you know fiction. Let's deal with it that way because we can't always you know get the guy in real life. And in this, it's just it it reminds us of the real world it reminds us of the terror we feel it doesn't distract us from it it's not escapism it's the opposite and just yeah the the the, the dread of where the next explosion will hit and who it will hit is just really gripping this is this is a very draining movie. I, it had been a while, it, it's, it's been a while since I watched it first, and I hadn't really watched it again since, and I had completely forgotten. It just really, it, it sucks you in, chews you up, and spits you back out. You know, after, after a viewing of this, you're gonna need some hours to, to get you know, you can probably tell by my... Uh, yeah. It, it just, it hits you hard. It is, it is a tragic tale. There, the movie really makes you feel that this, this world of, you know, th this superhero's world, this Gotham City is not a place where a, a win is is common, and even when it does happen, it's going to be a pyrrhic victory. And and it, that doesn't mean that you get to give up. That doesn't mean that you can stop fighting because someone needs to fight. Someone needs to you know take up the battle. This. 
the, the effects are again mostly practical and it really shows, it really helps the credibility with yeah, ma making us feel like, well not just making us feel like, we actually know, you know, wow, that actually blew up and that, I don't really want to give the action away, but yeah, you know, the action, by the way, much better than Begins. Again, I, I didn't really mention that in Begins, that it got a lot better, but I had completely forgotten it, frankly. Yeah, the, the coverage of the fights is much better. It's not as tight, it's not as quickly cut. You can follow what's going on here. However, that does mean that they basically sacrifice. It seems like Nolan can only do one or the other. They sacrificed Batman pulling people into the shadows from the shadows. You know, now you basically either see him or yeah, you know, it it's there's there's less of him in the shadows in this movie. I don't know. I I like both. If I had to choose, I'd maybe say I prefer seeing well, not seeing him, but you know, seeing goons just disappear into the shadows. But I don't know. It is. I really do appreciate being able to see what's going on in action scenes. You know, this has some really great chases as well. The tumbler is back, and we get to see the bat pod as well, which is basically the crap. I don't remember what it's called in the comics. I don't think it's the bat pod i think it's like the bat cycle or something but yeah the, the motorcycle is pretty cool i you know i like the design of it i like the design of it better than i like the tumbler certainly the the pace is great this movie never like i said earlier it never lets up i mean one thing is that it's really draining and it you know even when there is an action it's tense, and there's just this sense that, you know, it, you know, something bad will happen, something terrible is right around the corner, and that just, that feeling never disappears, right from the start, right to the end, you know, and actually, it opens with a bang, you know, again, I, I really am not going to give away how, but, yeah. The... I suppose that pretty much covers it, actually. The movie is about 2 hours, 15-20 minutes, not counting the credits. And this is a little much, but there's not really anything they could have cut. Pretty much, it, everything that's in there needs to be there. And like the first, it's very tight. Excuse me, with excuse me, with every scene setting something up or paying off on something and establishing and developing characters. Yeah, I believe that covers it. I've reviewed other parts of this series, the links are in the description box. Please rate and comment and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.